I braced myself. I know who was about to enter in a few seconds. A plumber can't fix the drain that's about to hit me. Jake! Jake, you have to help me, Jake! This is Peter Beggart. To say he's needy is an understatement. He always has a problem, and no matter how trivial, it's always a big one. So what's the matter? My life is a mess! When isn't it? I, I don't know what to do. I've tried everything! How about not whining? Everybody, everybody's against me, Jake. You're my only friend. I sometimes think my life would be so much better if it wasn't for those people. Good morning, church. Y'all know some of those people? <laughs> do, do we know some of those people? You know, those people that you're like, Man, I just, I feel like my life would be so much better without those people. You know, do you know people like that? That's not, that's not a response. You know you know people like that. When did we stop being real at Sold Out Church? I mean, you know you know people. In fact, you're looking across the room and you're going, yep, I know some of them. <laughs> we, we know some of those people. And we're going to spend a month talking about the different types of those people people because there are different types of those people and if you'll recall last month when we looked at our purposes what we're trying to accomplish you know that we're going to bring people in and do life with them as we live for God and equip them to do his work and the first thing we talked about last month bringing people in and we talked about loving people we have to love people we got to go and tell them the good news we we talked about how Christ has called us to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind, and secondly, love our neighbors as we love ourselves. But sometimes, sometimes your neighbors are some of those people. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to love those people. Sometimes it's hard. But even though it's hard, we're called to love them anyways. So I want to spend a month looking at how to deal with those people that sometimes bring us down, that sometimes try to steer us in a way that they want, or they're really, really critical. Sometimes we have people that are really critical, or sometimes we have people that are hypocritical. And so we got to learn how to deal with those people, because if we're going to be a church that's reaching, hurting people, well, we're going to be dealing with those people. So we, we, have to, we have to know how to deal with and how to minister to them in such a way that the love of Christ shines. Even though they're difficult and even though they're a challenge, we still want the love of Christ to shine through us as we minister even to those people. Now, I, I just want to share really quick. I talked about it Wednesday night, and I want to say to everybody that's here gathered today because not everyone was here Wednesday night, but last Sunday when we did the, the fifth part of our purpose, ministry, you know, we equipped to do His work. We went out and we did His work. We did Feed the Need. And at Feed the Need, 12 tons. 12 tons. That's 24,000. It was actually 24,186 pounds of food was raised when the church came together and you guys played a huge huge part in that. In fact, people actually told me that we're a part of it. You know, there were 19 churches total, including us, that came together. But everyone was shocked. They were shocked. And this is what's really cool. This is what's really cool. They were shocked when they found out that we didn't have a church service so that we could go over there and do that. They were like, wow, what an incredible church that y'all didn't have a worship service to go over here and do this Feed the Need. They were shocked because they, they thought we did that for that. Can you imagine their faces when I told them we do that every fifth Sunday? They were really shocked when they found out that we don't have traditional worship service every fifth Sunday. Instead, we go out and have a ministry service every fifth Sunday, and they were blown away. We're already changing the way people think. We're already changing the way people view church because they saw what we did. And I cannot wait to see the response from these other churches. Maybe they'll get on board with what we're doing. Can you imagine? And this needs to become our prayer, I believe. Can you imagine what it will be like if every single fifth Sunday, 19 churches come together in this city to do whatever? If we in four hours can raise 24,000 pounds of food, what could happen if every fifth Sunday, 19 churches in Conway came together to meet people's needs somehow? Imagine 
what we could do for the glory of God. Imagine. And that's why we need to be praying that God will begin working through even that to bring churches together, a united church to make a difference in this city right here, Holy River, Conway, where revival is taking place. Let's let that become our prayer. Let that become our prayer. Now, I've been getting back to today, though, today we are looking at those people. And you know you have some people like, today I, I want to look at overly needy people. Do you have people that just feels like they're overly needy in your life? I mean, they, they always, they just always need something. I mean, they just always need something be it attention or money or help with this people that just i mean they are always needing something you know these are the people that'll call you and leave you like a 42 minute voicemail talking about how much they miss you since the last time y'all talked seven minutes ago you, you, those people those overly needy people you're laughing because you know someone like that right now you're thinking of one of those people and honestly, I, I'm gonna, I, just got, I just need to lay this out here for you. If you don't know any of those people, you might be that person. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's true. You know, um, we're talking about people that are just always in a crisis. It, it's just one crisis to the other. Just, they just live from one crisis to another. Um, oftentimes we see this with people that are in addiction. And I know that we, we meet a lot of people's needs that are in addiction here, but I don't want it to just be that. You've got to understand, we see this also a lot with people that encounter financial distress. Spending more than we make. We, we see a lot people in crisis because their income is X amount, but their outcome is X to the third power. They're spending more than they make, and they're always in need. They're just overly needy. And, and we've, we've got to learn to look beyond the needs that are in front of us and see the root needs that's underneath. And that's what I want to look at today is how to really, really make a difference in people's lives when we meet the root need that they have. You know, we all want to help. That's, that's what Sold Out Church has been about since the beginning. We want, to, we want to help people. We want to make a difference in people's lives. We want to meet people's immediate needs so we can point them to their ultimate need. But what happens is sometimes, sometimes as we're helping people, Sometimes if we're not helping them in the right way, we're actually hurting them. Sometimes if we're not helping them in the right way, not only are we hurting them, but sometimes we bring harm upon ourselves when we're not helping in the right way. So we've got to learn to help needy people in the right way that does not harm them or us. We've got to help them in a way that's beneficial to them as well as doesn't bring harm upon us. And I'm not saying we should never sacrifice to meet people's needs. We should sacrifice to meet people's needs. But there's a difference in sacrificing for the glory of God to bring, to bring glory to His name and just reaping harm upon yourself because you've overstretched yourself continually, continually trying to meet the needs of people that are never learning a lesson. In fact, we see some codependent behaviors developing in people's lives as they try to continually meet people's needs. It's really not about even the person they're meeting their needs, but themselves. And they feel better as they're helping someone that's needing. We've got we to hit root issues. We've we, we got to get to the bottom of it. And there's really, there's two types of, there's two types of relief that we can give people. There's, there's two types of things. The first one is just a temporary relief. This is immediate and temporary assistance. Immediate and temporary assistance. This is the type of when you have a person that's in need. We give relief for um, tornadoes. You know, when a tornado hits, you give immediate assistance that's relief. That's why we call it disaster relief. We go and we, we give food and clothing because something, a crisis, a real crisis has happened. A house burning down you would give this type of assistance. Someone has been working somewhere for 20 years and all of a sudden they get a pink slip because the company is, is cutting people back and you, you help them out, but it's a, it's a temporary relief. It's a temporary type of assistance. I would even dare say that here at Sold Out Church, our old food pantry model, it was really this type of temporary assistance model. 
you know, people would come and we would give them something. Now, true, we, we prayed with people and we, we tried to meet people's needs, but they weren't actually learning anything. They were just kind of getting a handout and some prayer. That, that's what was going on, a handout and prayer. Now, we know for a fact that that's changed lives because when you take someone before the throne of God in prayer, God will begin working on their hearts because we have people here even today in this room right now that through coming and getting that immediate assistance, you found life change and now you're here and God is working on you so that you can make a difference. But this, is, this is, should be a temporary type thing. It's just relief. It's just relief. It's kind of like, like treating the symptoms of the flu. You know how sometimes when you have the flu and you've got a headache, You'll take Tylenol, and Tylenol is not really fixing. It's not really fixing. It's not really healing the flu, but it, it makes the headache feel better. It's just treating the symptom. Well, relief like that, this temporary assistance, it's treating a symptom. It's not dealing with the root cause. The other type is restoration, and that's what we really had to learn to do with overly needed people is bring restoration in their lives. Restoration is working with people to restore them to their God-given potential. Working with people to restore them to their God-given potential. Notice this is not doing something for. This is working with. This is working with. We have to work with them at the root cause of whatever is going on to meet these needs. These, these people that are always wanting to feel better about themselves and they need you to say a kind word in their lives because they forget who they are in Jesus Christ and they need to feel worth because you said something nice to them. We, we, we've got we to restore them to their given potential and make them realize that they are precious. They are precious, bought with the blood of Jesus Christ and it's not about what we speak into their lives but about what God's word speaks into their lives. It's about what God has spoken into their lives through His Word. That's, that's a root issue with someone that needs attention is they got to see who they are in God's eyes. So we want to restore them to their God-given potential. And I'm going to tell you, this takes a lot of time and effort. It, it, it really, really does. It takes a lot of time and effort if you have someone that's an addict. See, relief, you can just go, hey, let me just get you, let me just come pick you up and get you out of this situation that you're in and I'll just take you over here. But there's no restoration there. Restoration takes time. It takes coming alongside them. It takes shedding some tears with people. It takes praying with people. It takes being there for them in their darkest hours. It does take taking them somewhere, but it's not just away from the situation. It's to get help at a treatment facility, steering them in that direction where they can go in and actually find recovery for their lives. When you, when you look at this, I mean, people that are insecure and they feel worthless, it's, it's taking them and sitting down with them, and having Bible studies together, studies that maybe focus on who God sees us as. Not who we see ourselves as, and not who other people see us as, but who God sees us as. And it takes time to do that. I mean, you can read, you can read anything in God's Word today. You can read one sentence today, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to sink in and change things. It takes time as the Word permeates within you, and it marinates, and, and, it, and it grows and blossoms within you, and it starts transforming you. It takes time, and we've got we to lead people into this. That's what restoration is. It's not just putting that Band-Aid on it saying, oh, you need to feel better about yourself. Your hair looks nice. That's, that's not what we have to do. That would be relief. We need true restoration, and that comes from God's Word. Um, if you're dealing with people that are broke, you know, broke people. I know you know broke people because we some broke people. <laughs> when you're dealing with people that are broke all the time, it means coming alongside them, maybe sitting down, helping them, developing a budget, helping them overcome what they're facing. They've been spending too much. Remember, their income was X, but their outcome is X to the third power. It's sitting down and, and scaling things back and learning to live within a means that's, that's manageable. And that takes time because people have to start cutting things out of their lives. And, and you've got to come alongside them and help them with this and show them that it's possible. You can't just put a Band-Aid on it and go, oh, you need your bill paid? Sure, let me help you out. Because if you just pay that bill, what will people keep doing? They'll keep coming back. You know, when you feed a stray dog, what's it do? It keeps coming back for more food. If you, if you train that dog, though, and you teach that dog, that dog can actually become useful for hunting 
or guarding or being a watchdog, shepherding even. Mm. We could train people that are needy and teach them and come alongside them even to the point where they could be shepherds. That's what we want. That's what we want. We want people to become shepherds because me as a pastor, the word pastor simply means shepherd. That's all I am. I'm a shepherd, a shepherd of sheeple. <laughs> I'm a shepherd. That's what I am. And if we come alongside people, even though they're maybe overly needy, we can train them and equip them and build them up to the point that they become shepherds. We want restoration in people's lives so that they can reach their God-giving potential. That's what we want. Just meet, not meeting that immediate need, but seeing beyond it. Seeing to what's deeper. Seeing to what's below. We tend to offer relief when people really need restoration. And so today, when we're dealing, looking at overly needy people in our lives, I want us to focus on restoration. So I'm going to I'm going to go into God's Word, but before I do, we're, we're going to pray. And I do pray that, that the Lord will speak to us. And guess where we're camping out today? Where was we at last month? In the book of Acts? Today we're going to continue learning from the book of Acts, the early church, Peter and John. We're going to learn some things about them, about meeting people's needs and bringing restoration, not just relief. So if y'all will join me in prayer. God, I do thank you today for everyone that's here, Lord. I thank you because we all have people in our lives, those people that are overly needy that just drain us sometimes. And Lord, we don't want to be drained. We want to be filled with your presence and with your spirit, with your power. And Lord, we want to, we want to share that with people. We want to see restoration in people's lives, Lord. We don't want to see just an immediate need that brings relief. Lord, we want to see lives completely transformed. Lives that are set aside for you. So, Lord, today through your word, show us how. Show us how to bring restoration into people's lives so that they can meet the potential that you purposed them for when you created them. In Jesus' name, amen. I was just thinking, <laughs> you know, y'all remember that um, movie? I guess it was Jerry Maguire where Jerry Maguire tells the girl, he says, you complete me. You remember that? My favorite version of that is, of course, in The Dark Knight when the Joker tells Batman, you complete me, you know? That's an even better version of that. And sometimes, like, sometimes it's like, as a pastor, sometimes I feel like people are sometimes telling me, like, you complete me. I can't get by without you. And I'm like, you deplete me. <laughs> I'm serious like people sometimes put me in a place that I don't need to be it's unhealthy and today we're, we're gonna we're, we're gonna learn how to put God in his proper place so going into in the Acts chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 we were in Acts chapter 2 we finished at verse 47 Remember, we finished at verse 47 and daily and those that were being added to their number those that were being saved added to their number daily all right so today picking up very next chapter, right after that verse, one day, Peter and John. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. It was at three in the afternoon. Now a man, crippled from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them, for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention. He was expecting to get something from them. You had to know right here that there were three places for people to beg. They were really good places, you know. People that beg have their hot spots. And there were three hot spots in the New Testament in Jerusalem. There were three hot spots. One was along the road. And we see this sometimes, you know, where people get on and off the interstate, you know, where, where lots of traffic flows. People would get on the road, on the road, so that passerbys would see them, passersby, however you say that, people passing by would see them and they could ask them, hey, help me. And they would get in high traffic areas because if you get, you know, a penny from a thousand people, well, then you're doing pretty well. And so if you have a lot of volume of people coming by, even if they're just giving a little bit, 
they would end up okay at the end of the day. Another place that they would go, another place that they would go would be to out in front of rich people's houses. Because, I mean, if you're in front of a rich person's house, they don't want their property to look bad, you know? So they might give you something to get you on down the road. So you might not have to be there as long. You might have not have to have a thousand people come by because that rich person will come out, check the mail, and be like, hey, look, here's a hundred. Just get on out of here, you know? And so they would, they would actually meet in front of rich people's houses in the third place that they would meet. This is great. The third place that they would meet, playing off of people and how they believed, in the temple courts. <laughs> Walmart. The, peop the people of Walmart. Um, those people of Walmart. Don't, don't Google that unless you want to laugh. Um, they would meet in the temple courts. And the reason they would do that, let's talk about our Pharisee friends. You know, our, our Pharisees who thought that what they did made them right with God and they liked to do things for show, saying their big long prayers, and they liked to give so that everyone could see. They wanted to, when the tithe plate comes by, they wanted to go, hey, look, I'm dropping it in here, you know. They wanted everybody to know what was going on. So when you have beggars gathering together in the temple courts and you have Pharisees gathering together in the temple courts, they want to look good, so what would they likely do? Oh, Oh, I'm a man of God. I'm righteous. Let me just drop this off in here for this guy. Everybody look as I help out this man who's been crippled from birth. You see how I did that? Because I'm holy. That's what they would do. Beggars are smart. They're smart. They knew where to go. And this guy, he would get carried every day to a place where people would come along and go, Oh, let me help you so that glory will go to God. Here we go. This guy, that's where he was. He'd get carried there. But he's just going. He's just going there for relief. First off, listen, someone's carrying him to a place. He's crippled from birth. They're carrying him to a place. He needs to find a wheelchair or something, you know? He's getting carried to a place. People right there are already providing relief for him instead of maybe bringing them into their home and, and taking care of him, helping, helping him really out. The, someone go, hey, it's easy for me to just throw you in my cart and just carry you down to this place. They're providing relief. They would bring him there, drop him off, and then he would ask for money, and people would give him money, and it was relief for his situation. What was his real problem? His real problem was the fact he's crippled. That's his real problem. Now, I know that we can't just lay hands on each other and, like, heal people from being crippled all the time. If God does it, He does it, and He can do it. Amen, He can do it, but it doesn't just happen every time. Well, this guy, he's crippled. Now, Peter and John, it just so happens, they're living in the apostolic age where, where God is still really, really doing a lot of miracles to prove who He is through His servants. And so they come by, and they look, and Peter says, Hey, listen, silver or gold, I don't have that. I don't have silver or gold. In fact, I'm just as broke as you, okay? I don't have silver or gold, but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And then taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. This is the best example in the Bible of not a handout, but a hand up. He didn't, he didn't give him a handout. He helped him up. He gave him help to help him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. I bet he was like, woohoo, you know, I bet. Can you imagine you've been crippled since birth? And all of a sudden you can walk? This guy, I mean, it's a fantabulous day for him. He's really excited. This dude is fired up now. He got up, he began to walk, and he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and doing cartwheels and somersaults and all these things. I, I, I added that, but it does say walking and jumping and praising God. I mean, how could you not? He's been crippled his whole life, and now he's been restored to his God-given potential where he can walk and he can tell people what God has did for him. He can bring glory to God, which is what God wants us to do. Now this man has the ability to go down the road and do that. He's been restored to his God-given potential to bring glory to God on high. That is beautiful, but here's what those that helped him did. They helped him with restoration by helping him up. They said, listen, you have to believe. You have to stand up. They didn't stand him up. They helped him stand up. 
They didn't carry him anywhere. They helped this man stand up is what it says. They helped him stand up. But they're saying, I'll give you a hand to help you up, but you have to stand up on your own. Do you see this? We got, we got to do our part. We have to do our part too. When, when, when you are dealing with someone that's needy, they have to do their part too. They have to, they have to stand up themselves. And we typically don't work with them. We work for them because we believe that we are the ingredient that's necessary in their life. We have to carry them to this place. We have to pick them up. We have to give them the money. That's not the right way to go about this. We have to learn to give a hand to help people up. So three prayers today that I have for us. Um, prayers of a restore, for us to become restoring agents in people's lives, for us to become people that bring restoration and not provide relief. Do you want to you provide relief or do you want to provide restoration in people's lives? Restoration. Restoration. Our God is the God of restoration. We want to provide restoration. So, the reason we pray if we want to be restorers, praying puts us in a place that reminds us that we're not the ones that's doing it anyways. It connects us to the one that does. And we connect them to the one that does. So the first thing that we pray is God. God, help me give people what they truly need, not just what they want. Help me give people what they truly need, not just what they want. I have to pray that prayer every day. Lord, help me. Help me give people what they're truly needing and not just what they're wanting because we want so many things. We want it our way, right away, right now. Lord, help me. Help me give people what they need, not just what they want. We've got to learn to pray that. It says, Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. This man that was crippled needed Jesus, and he needed healing from his disability. He needed healing. He didn't just need money. He needed healing. And they saw what he truly needed. They looked beyond what he was saying. He was saying, let me get a little money. Wes, you want to throw some change my way? They looked beyond that. They saw what was really going on in his life. And that's what they did. We have to learn to see what's really going on in people's lives beyond just what they're saying. We have to look beyond what they're saying and identify the real need. People come to you. I know you've had people come to you. People come to me a lot. Hey, I need money. I need some money. Can I get some money for some gas? I need some money for some gas. You know, I, gotta, I, I need a little money. Um, I, I just don't have money to pay my phone bill. I, I, I don't have money for my phone bill. Like, can I get some money for my phone bill? Hey, I don't, I don't have money to buy any Hanes, and I need some Hanes, and I give them money for Hanes because everybody needs Hanes, you know? Um, <laughs> that's a need. That's not a want. That's a need. Put some drawers on. <laughs> now you know where that came from, Nate. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> that's a real need. We got to look at the real need. And people say, oh, I, I need money. I need money. I need money. And I'm like, where are you working? Well, you know, um, showed up late at this place, so they fired me. And then I called in six, 17 times in a week at this place. 17 times in a week. Yeah, I know it seems unlikely, but it happens. And I got fired from there, too. And, and then what had happened was is, um, I failed a drug test at my other job. And so I don't have a job there. And I'm like, you, what you need, you don't need money. You need a job. You need a work ethic. You need to show up on time. You need to take responsibility and get up and clean up and go to work and earn a paycheck. Because sometimes that's what people need. They need to go to work. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, y'all know, I, I don't want to seem harsh because y'all know I worked with homeless people for a long, long time. And there are homeless people that the reason they're there is not because they need a job. It's because they have severe mental illnesses or severe chemical addictions. And so even then, we got to work to meet that need of getting them on the medication that will balance them so that they can get a job or get them into a program so that they can get off the drugs so that they can get a job. Or if they're not able to function at a job, get them the disability so that they can live a life off the streets, but meeting those needs. You see, not just what they're saying, give me money, but meeting those needs. Man, hey, look, let's, let's go beyond homelessness. I've had people call me, Derek, Derek, I'm in a situation. Man, I need $580 
to pay my car payment for my brand new 2015 car that I just got two weeks ago. I, I, I can't make the payment on my car. What you need is not $580 to pay your car payment. What you need is to live within your means and not buy that car in the first place. Your $580 car payment is more than I paid for my car. Yeah, I paid 500 bucks for my car. It's got a crack in the windshield, but it gets 40 miles a gallon. It's fun to drive. Hug a corner like a motorcycle. That jet is great. <laughs> Don't live beyond your means. So often people contact me. I know people have contacted you, people in your family. You know, your crazy third cousin Larry, you know, or whoever it is. There, there's people that contact you and they're asking you for things and it's not what they really need. They need to learn to live within their means. We've got to teach people, live within your means. We've we, we got to, we have to do this. Um, <laughs> talking about that attention thing. Oh, I just, I'm so, I'm feeling so down and out today. <sighs> Think I'm having an anxiety attack because I'm feeling so down and out. Can you just make me feel special? Just, just make me feel special right now. Just say, just just say something to me that will make me feel special. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you so much, He gave Jesus for you. If that don't make you feel special, then what does? You don't need me. You just need God's Word to remind you you are special, whether I make you feel special or not. And those people that call you, oh my gosh, Olivia, I'm hurting so bad right now. Somebody said my hair is turning gray. <laughs> Can you make me feel better about it? Yeah, Derek. A gray head is a crown of splendor. A hoary head is a sign of wisdom. Put them back in God's Word. Don't make them feel better because, oh, you're handsome anyways. You know, don't do that. I know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I talk to people, guys, and, and I know it's not just me as a pastor problem, because who all knows someone whose marriage is in trouble? Who all knows someone whose marriage is in trouble? It, it's not just me they talk to. They're talking to you, too. You know how I know? You know their marriage is in trouble because they're talking to you. And, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll just hear one side of it, or it'll be a relationship with teenagers even, you know? Like, oh, you'll just hear one side of it. Oh, my gosh, he does this. Oh, my gosh, she does that. And... You know what I find out more often than not? The real issue is that the man is not being a man in a relationship and then leading the woman that he's with to the Lord through prayer, through devotions, the reading of God's Word. And that's the root issue. You're not being a man, so she ain't got no respect for you. That's the root issue. Am I being too hard today? Maybe, I, maybe I'm venting a little bit. I don't know. I just know that we have needy people that need to remember who God created us to be, and we have worth in Him. We have value in Him. And if we point people back to God's Word, they can overcome. But we've got to look beyond that surface level of need and see what's really going on in their lives. We've got to look beyond the surface and see the real thing. And when we do help someone, I'm going to tell you right now, you've got to set clear, 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 clear. I'm saying that seven times. Clear, 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 clear boundaries about what you will and will not do. Set clear boundaries about what you will and will not do. Your child says, man, I'm going to go to college. You know, I'm going to college and uh, dad, I need money from you for college. I'm going to set very clear boundaries with my child at this point. I'm going to say, okay, I will help you with your tuition to the best of my ability, which will be like $1.50 a week or something. I'm going to help you to the best of my ability if you will maintain a 3.0 GPA. But if you fall beyond that, well, you're on your own because you're not going to go to school on my dime and party and live it up while I'm paying for it. So if this is something you want, then you're going to have to do your part. Um, Deuce has a motorcycle right now. I know Deuce got a motorcycle. But Deuce has to do his part. Deuce can't even learn to ride the motorcycle until he gets his permit. Set clear boundaries. Before you can even even try to learn to ride that. you got to do your part and get your permit. Sorry, son, I just, it's important they understand that boundaries, I practice what I preach. you gotta, you got to set 
boundaries. You have to set boundaries. You know, some of us parents, man, I'm going to tell you, I know a lot of parents, I'll talk to them and they're exasperated when I talk to them. Oh my gosh, I had so many things to do today. Oh my gosh, I was freaked out. And like, wow, what, what happened? Well, my kid, they forgot to do their science project. So then I had to run to Staples and then I had to run to Walmart and then I had to go get a pillowcase and I had to do all these things. And it's because they told me at the last minute and they just ruined my day. Listen, tell your child, you just got an F, Bubba. Next time, you'll know and you'll let me know in advance. <laughs> we, we protect our kids. You've got to set boundaries. I, I, w- I would honestly, if my kids tell me, Dad, Dad, can you, can you help me do this because I don't know how, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set a clear boundary. Use Google. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube it. It's there. In the old days, I would have taken them to the library. <laughs> teach, teach them to do things on their own and set boundaries on what you're going to do. Or if not, you'll end up with a kid that lives with you until like you die and they're playing video games in their bedroom your entire life or Jesus comes back first. You, you, gotta sit. you can stay here until the end of the month. And that's not just with your kids. That's with anyone that you bring into your house. Because I do believe that we should help people at times. You know, we should shelter people at times. But when we do, we've got to say, this is, this is what you have. You have a month. You have two months. You have three months. Whatever it is, this is how long you can stay, and then you, you have to go. You've got this amount of time. You're not going to live off of my dime. You've got to teach people. We have, if not, all, all we're doing is giving them relief, and the problem will become perpetual, and they'll never overcome. They will not find restoration in their lives. We got, we, people have to have restoration. So the next thing we pray is, God, and this is in line with what I'm, what I'm talking about with the boundaries, God, help me stay out of your way by not continually rescuing people from their consequences. God, help me stay out of your way by not continually rescuing people from their consequences. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. That's Galatians 6, 7. And sometimes we just have to pay the piper. That's what we really need sometimes. Sometimes what we really, really need more than anything else is to face the consequences of our actions. Sometimes that is what we need. You know, my gosh, we just overprotect kids today because someone told me their child, they went up to the school. They went up to the school and they, they argued with the principal about the fact that the child got detention. I said, you can't give them detention. I brought them to school late. You can't give them detention for being there because I, I brought them late. I said, well, how come you brought them late? Well, they forgot to set their alarm. They forgot to set their alarm and they didn't get up. And um, when I woke them up, you know, because normally they get up on their own, they didn't set their alarm. And so when I woke them up, then they, they were angry and grumpy with me and they took forever getting ready. And so finally I got them to school late. Why does that child not need detention? Whose fault was that really? Was it mom's for getting them there late? Or was it the child's for not taking care of the responsibility? Now, as parents, don't get me wrong. We should be a backup to our kids. I mean, we should. But my kids have their own alarms. My kids get up on their own. We're, we're a backup to them. Why? They've got to learn that now because one day they're going to be out of my house. If they don't set their alarm, they're going to end up losing their job. And they're going to have to go to one of the prominent places to beg because I'm not going to give them a Band-Aid. I'm not going to do it. We, we have to start teaching them early. We gotta, but, and we're overprotecting kids and we're not making them deal with the consequences of their actions. You think about the prodigal son. I mean, what did he let the, what did he let the, the father, what did he let his prodigal son do? He didn't go get him out of the pig pen when he was in the pig pen, did he? He let him stay in the pig pen until the son realized, hey, this is not what I want. I need to make some changes in my life because this is a terrible place to be. He faced the consequences of his actions. He wanted all his money. He went and spent it. And then he was stuck living in a pig pen, realizing his father's servants got taken care of better than him. His dad didn't come get him out of the pig pen. His dad waited on him to come home. But when the son came home and decided to make wise choices, what did the dad do? 
Loved him as if no mistake had ever been made. And that is critical. That is critical in meeting hurting people's needs, be it your children, a loved one, a friend, or whatever. When they get right, no matter how many times they messed up and took advantage or whatever it is, when they start making those wise choices and they start doing the right thing, man, you love them. You love them and you don't hold that over their head. In fact, you celebrate what they've done. Go kill a cow and throw a party. That's what the dad did. But don't kill a cow unless you have a cow. Don't just go kill some random cow because then you'll go to jail and I'll have to bring relief by coming and praying with you. So um, don't, don't just go kill a random cow, but celebrate what they do. That's what I'm saying. Celebrate what they do. Celebrate it and just celebrate the fact that they finally decided I've had enough. Celebrate the fact that you got out of their way and God showed them how to live better and they have decided I'm ready to do it. Celebrate that. Don't hold the past over them. Why? Well, the last one is, is God, help me remember that I'm in need too and that you're always the answer. Remember when you were in the pig pen? We, we've all been in some pig pen of some sort. We've all been there. And now we're not. Now we're overcoming. But it was God that was the answer. And we have to remember at all times that we're in need too. I'm in need too. And that's the thing that strikes me. And sometimes people need me to be something for them that God never intended me to be in their lives. They need encouragement from me. Hey, you know what? I need encouragement too. You know where my strength comes from? I lift my eyes up. My help comes from the Lord. Don't y'all love it when I sing? I like singing and dancing. I need encouragement too. I have hard days too. Sometimes I feel like I'm sucking. I do. Jane, I just told you the other day, I felt like I was sucking. You said, no, you're not. Get back in the game. I need encouragement too, but I have to turn to God. I'm in need, guys. Y'all see me as, oh, this, this pastor, he's cool, man. Derek's cool, and he's got it figured out. The only thing I have figured out is that I desperately need Jesus every single day of my life, or I will suck it up. That's what I know. I learned that when I faced the consequences of my actions. When I was 17 years old was the beginning of me learning a, a, a long, it took me a long time, but that was the beginning when I got thrown out of my house at 17 and was living out of my car, living out of my car. And I finally realized, this sucks. This sucks. So you know what I did? I went and got a J-O-B. That's what I did. And then news came along. And I was like, well, there's got to be more. I've got to do something more. So I joined the Air Force. But I was doing all of this on my own, and I wasn't really turning to the one that meets needs, and I ended up, as we all know, behind bars. And then I really, really, really realized, I'm sick of this pig pen. I'm sick of it. And I'm not just fixing to go to my mother's home. It's time to go to my father's home. It's time to go to church. It, it, it's, it's time to go to church. Now, now y'all know I, I don't believe we go to church because we are the church. I'm just saying it was time to turn to him. It was time to turn to him. And let the church say, praise God that you did, Derek, because here we are. Here we are. We've got to let people face the consequences of their actions. We've got to give them a hand up, but not a hand out. We got to stay out of God's way because sometimes, well, sometimes God needs us to be in the pig pen so we can learn how much we truly need Him. Sometimes we got to get down in the mud, broken. Not everybody's got to get down in that mud, broken. Some people just have to go bankrupt and file chapter seven, and then they realize how much they need Him. That's still down in the mud. I know when we think of mud, we think dirty, disgusting, and not everyone here has lived a life where you got just down in that dirty, disgusting mud. But the point is, is when you get to that place where you face consequences of your actions and there's no one there to bail you out, you end up going, this is not working for me anymore. It's, it's time to clean up. I've got to get this filth off of me. It's, it's time to turn to someone that can truly meet my needs. And he can meet our needs. Can the Lord meet your needs? So when overly needy people come to you, if you remember how much you have a need and who truly met your need, 
then you can point them to their ultimate need because he's the one that met your need. Amen? I got it. Um, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you today. Even as I look out and I see heads nodding, tears flowing, Lord, I know that you're ministering to people, Lord. So as I begin talking to them, Lord, I pray that your spirit will just be moving. I pray that your spirit will be moving, Lord, and that you will just be reminding them of our ultimate need and that we will begin to learn to stay out of your way. And Lord, I, I, I pray that as, as I begin talking to them about this, Lord, that you will just begin working in their hearts right now. Now, with every head bowed and with every eye closed, what I'd like to know is have you been have you been trying to be the fixer in people's lives have have you been feeling like you're the only one that can do anything about the situation because if you think it's only you you're making our god too small have you been letting people get by without facing the consequences of their actions have you forgotten who met your need? If God is speaking to you right now and you want me to pray with you right where you're at, and let me let me see your hands. Praise God. I see. Wow, I see your hands everywhere. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you. Let me just pray with you guys right where you're at. Lord, I just I thank you for all of these that have bravely raised their hands, Lord, that your word is speaking to. Lord, it's so easy for us because you have gifted us and purposed us. Lord, it's so easy for us to try to be the fixer. But Lord, we're not. You are the fixer and we only connect to you. So Lord, remind us of our need for you and let us get in our proper place, a place of prayer for people. And let us see with eyes that are wide open beyond, beyond what's at the surface and what people say they need, but what they really, really need. And remind us that truly at the end of the day that true need is in you you've laid out in your word for us a map of how to live lives where we're not in the pig pen but we are walking along a narrow path that is full of blessing so Lord I pray that you will just really really remind them remind me even of my daily need for you Lord let us not be afraid to trust your plan and let people reap what they sow and face the consequences of their actions because we know that even so, you are working for the good of those that love you who have been called according to your purpose. So we will trust you in the lives of those that we love. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe somebody came in here today and that ultimate need has not been met. You, you, you have a longing in your heart. You're looking for something. God created us for a relationship with Him. And once we enter into that relationship with Him, He uses us to bring glory to His name. But some of you maybe came in today and you're not in that relationship with Him and you feel, you feel broken. You feel like you're in that pig pen. You feel like your life is not what it should be. The Bible teaches us that we can have life and have it abundantly. Life abundantly. A life that is as it should be. A life full of meaning and purpose. And we can have that when we understand that Jesus Christ came. He came so that we might know Him, that we might know God through Him. He came so that we might have forgiveness of our sin. And right there, I say that religious word, sin, and maybe you're going, sin. I hear people talk about sin. Everything is sin. It's just sin, sin, sin. What is sin? Sin is nothing more than disobedience to God. It's not honoring your mother or father. It's telling a lie, even a little white one. It's stealing. It's putting things before God. It's just disobedience to God in general. And sin must be paid for with death. That's why people die. But Jesus came and gave his life so that even though we die, we might live, we might be forgiven of our sins if we will surrender to him, if we will ask him to forgive us of our sin, and if we will say, Lord, I'm yours. I want to live for you. I want life abundantly. 
I want to live a blessing in my life. If you came in today and your life has felt empty, it doesn't feel like it has purpose. But you're hearing this and God is convicting you right now. If everyone bow your heads and close your eyes, if you're hearing this and today, today you want to ask the Lord to forgive you because you believe that he came and died in your place. But not only that, that he rose from the grave three days later, showing us that when he promises we will have life eternal, that we will have life eternal because he's conquered death. If today you want to be forgiven and you want purpose, you want life abundantly, today is a day of your salvation. You would say, Lord Jesus, save me. Let me see your hands. today and I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward and as they come forward um, I'm going to tell you I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest today sometimes I know we get tired of hearing this why does he talk about this the Bible teaches us that where our heart is there our treasure will be also or where our treasure is our, our heart will be there we are in a situation right now at sold out church where Frankly, many of you who possibly even signed partnership covenants stating, stating that you would meet the expectations of partnership, which means returning the tithe to the storehouse, which means being generous. Some of you, I believe, have been in sin because you're not holding to your word because giving is down. And if where our heart is, our treasure is, if we love this place as we say, and it's a family, more importantly, if we love God as we say, if we trust Him with our souls, how can we not trust Him with our tithe? When He promises us, He promises us to return the tithe to the storehouse, and He'll open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessing upon us. How can we not trust Him? I'm just going to tell you right now. You can be mad. He's talking about money again. No, you're missing out if you're not giving back to God what belongs to Him. You're flat out missing out. And I'm not going to let you miss out on it. He is going to bless you because He's going to build your faith so that when the real storms come, you'll be able to trust Him because He delivered you when you thought you needed that 10%. And realize you don't. What you need is 90% with God's blessing on it. That's what you need. So, I'm going to pray over our tithes and offerings today, and I'm going to pray because we've got to get back on track. We've got to get back on track. So, Lord, I do thank you personally for this opportunity to return to you what is yours. It is yours, God. So I present it to you, Lord, and I pray that you'll hold accountable with your spirit those that have committed to doing this, and they're not. And even for those that have not committed to doing it, that they'll trust your word and they'll do it because they'll understand this is a form of worship and it's disobedient, which is sinful not to do it. You've called us to return to you what is yours. You have given us eternal life. We gladly give this back to you. And Lord, I do pray blessing over it and over our lives and that what we give will be used where we can see the fruit of what we give. But Lord, we want to see so much fruit that the whole world says, wow, that church right there is the most generous, giving, meeting people's ultimate need church I've ever seen in my life. That little group of people that are completely sold out for you are changing the world because they're generous and it results in thanksgiving to you on every occasion. Lord, that's my prayer today. So I lift up our tithes and offerings to you. I pray blessing over it in Jesus' name. Amen. also after all of that <laughs> this is kind of funny to me even after all of that 
because we, we just did an act of obedience, okay? We returned our tithes to the storehouse, but today, and we don't do this often, all right? We, you know that you're here, but today I'm, I'm actually, we're going to take up a special offering today in addition to our tithes and offerings, and this is one of those ones, it's just going above and beyond. It, it's needed, and the reason it's needed is because not everyone has been obedient like I believe that they should be, and so it's kind of put us in this position, but here's the reality. VBS is coming up, okay? And we have a short, yeah, but we have a shortfall on some of the things that we're trying to do with VBS. Now, this year, we have been praying. We've been praying that 200 children will be here for VBS. And we've been praying that their lives will be transformed. And just, just really quick, by a show of hands, whoever went to a VBS, and you'll never forget it, and the Lord moved in a mighty way on your behalf at a VBS at any point in your life, then you understand how beautiful a VBS is. It's a beautiful thing. Now, we need to take up today a special offering, all right? We need to take up a special offering to get everything that we need for this VBS because we are wanting kids from all over the city to come and have an incredible counter with this church right here that's a family. I mean, think about what God has been doing in your life through this church. What if we can get kids from this city in here and they can experience God's goodness in this house of worship and prayer and they can realize they didn't go to a church to VBS. They became the church as they surrendered their lives to the Lord at a VBS. How wonderful indeed that will be. We have a great VBS in store. It's from July 13th to 17th, Rachel, from 6 to 8 p.m. We're feeding these kids every single night that they're here. We're feeding them. That's not free. So we're going to take up a special offering. It's a one-time special offering. Just if God moves on June. Thank you. Thank you. June 13th, as in next week. Two weeks. What's today? It's the fifth. Not this Monday, but next Monday. Yeah, that's when. What today is it? <laughs> so whatever the Lord moves you, I mean, if it's 50 cents, a dollar, if somebody cuts a check that makes her eyes boggle, praise God, whatever it is, just whatever the Lord leads you to do. And don't feel guilty if you don't give. This is an offering above and beyond our tithe. This is just us being generous to make a difference in kids' lives. So I'm going to pray over our special VBS offering today. Lord, I do thank you for the generous people we have in this church, Lord, that are willing to go above and beyond because we believe that if we can reach the children, Lord, we can change the future for your glory and your name, Lord. We want these kids to live lives completely set aside for you. We see all over the world the way that kids are becoming and we want the kids that come through this door not to become like the world, but to become more like you. So God, let us be generous right now and may our offering be fruitful in the lives of kids at this VBS that we know because we've experienced it ourselves. May our offering, may our offering be a blessing and may kids' lives be changed at this VBS and let the church stand in agreement in Jesus' name. Amen. those hellos earlier. I'm really sorry about that. Dear worship. Just have a few reminders. Um, we are looking for volunteers, so if you are interested in signing up for connections or kiddos, um, if you would step outside this room right here and talk to um, Melissa, she can get you signed up and help. Also, VBS is coming up and we do need volunteers for that, so if you're interested in helping us, please just go out there to the connections room. Let's pray. Lord, please give me the strength to assist and to restore those in need. Help me to show them your ways, Lord. Show me how to bring restoration in people's lives. 
and to help me to give them what they truly need, not just what they want, Lord. Help me to remember to direct them back to you. Lord, help me to remember that I'm in need too. I need you every day. Help to keep me on focus, Lord, to keep my heart focused on you. Help to keep me on the right track and look up to you always. Please be with us as we go throughout this week and everything that we do be done in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a good day.